Colorado Mountains right here, where that cursor is. Hopefully you can see that. And Las Vegas being up to directly north of that. Uh, the purple is basically saying that's an igneous rock, like I just said. And if you go south further down, they get into this, see this green stuff. That's a uh, metamorphic rock. Metamorphic rock, just real quick, is rock that was emerged, then sank back down, got pressed on hard by the earth, and came back to something different. So uh, they're a little different in the south, where they're also a little bit higher. And there is a distinct there is a distinction between the north and the south portions of the range, biologically speaking, as well as for bighorn. So those are bighorn sheep. Those are two ewes out of spring, not in the McCullough's, but again, I'm working with what I have. So McCullough Mountains are home to about approximately 225 bighorn based on a count that was done in 2018. Uh, the, the Nevada Department of Wildlife will do aerial surveys. Basically, we send two biologists up in a helicopter to count the bighorn that they see to get a, a very accurate assessment of the amount of sheep that we have on the range and the herd size. This gives us a lot of information on how we can manage these things, how they're doing, as well as how we, how we manage our, our tags, our hunting tags that we then administer uh, to hunters that want to hunt these big horn sheep. So this is uh, where big horn sheep are found. This is a terrible graph I pulled off the internet and it's not really indicative uh, or, or, or accurate matter, but it does give you an idea of where they range. They range down south in Mexico, all the way up to Canada, uh, the Canadian Rockies down south of the Sierra Madre. Big horn sheep are strongly, if you look at this map, are strongly associated with mountains. That's where they are. They don't want to be in valleys. They don't want to be in flat areas. They want to be in nasty, steep stuff, stuff that you and I would probably generally avoid. Uh, if we were hungry mountain lions or Native Americans with uh, bows and arrows that wanted to eat these things. So um, they, they, they do have several different subspecies on this. This is uh, our zeroing in Nevada and a better graphic. Um, we have several different subspecies. Uh, there's really only three subspecies that are currently defined. There's the Sierra that with the advent of genetic testing um, has basically given us a lot clearer picture of this. Uh, we have the desert bighorn, the uh, uh, Ovis canadensis navadensis, or sorry, <laughs> Ovis canadensis nelsonii. Uh, and that it makes up the basically the entirety of the desert and what is listed on this map as California. The state of Nevada makes a distinction between California and Desert Bighorn. Um, I guess they don't cross Highway uh, 80 right there, <laughs> but they're really genetically similar enough that they're not a distinct subspecies. Uh, distinct subspecies we do uh, have is the Rocky Mountain uh, uh, subspecies, which is uh, Ovis canadensis, I can't remember. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's the Rocky Mountain subspecies of the sheep. Uh, and it is found in the much higher ranges in the eastern portion of the state, uh, such as the Ruby Mountains and the Snake Range and Mount Moriah, um, as well as a few. Uh, Nevada, it's worth noting, and if you look at this map, Nevada has actually sourced as, as serves as a source population for a lot of the desert bighorns that are found now uh, across their, their range because Nevada was, has been so successful at managing these species. Uh, that they have a plethora, I wouldn't say a plethora, but <laughs> enough to share. <laughs> so a lot of uh, desert bighorns from Utah uh, all the way out to Texas and down into Mexico, even we send sheep down there, uh, have their origins in Nevada stock. Should be a source of state pride. <laughs> so uh, bighorn sheep, some fairly uh, caparinier uh, with goats and ibex. They're very similar physiology to domestic sheep. Uh, I wish they share the same genus of Ovis, which is domestic sheep, Marco Polo sheep, and thinhorn sheep. Uh, thinhorn being from uh, also called stone sheep. Um, they're up in Alaska <laughs> and uh, the Yukon. So bighorn are named are named the large curved horns. Obviously, they're, they're big, huge horns. The males have very large horns. The the females, the ewes, have a much smaller set, but both sexes have horns. They are true horns in that they are not shed uh, and they are composed of hair fibers, uh, keratin fibers that are uh, outside of a uh, form of sheath around a bone. So their skull is actually has the horns. So if you look at a skull of uh, say an antlered animal like deer, their horns, their antlers grow every year and then they shed them. 
there's only one animal in the world that has true horns that sheds anything off their horn. That's pronghorn. The pronghorn are weird. So um, the, the rams can weigh about 230 pounds when they're really heavy. And the ewes will weigh about 180 pounds uh, when they're really heavy. Um, uh, on sheep capture one time, I remember picking up a, 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 a ram that was I thought was going to be significantly smaller because his horns were significantly smaller, but he ended up weighing about 230. Um, and that is because, uh, as opposed to his counterpart, who weighed about 180, uh, who had a huge rack, a huge set of horns, and that is because he had been fighting all year in the rut. Uh, he was a starting quarterback in the rut, <laughs> whereas the other guy who I grabbed, thinking he was lighter, uh, he was sitting on the bench all year and therefore wasn't losing all that, uh, all that, those calories uh, trying to fight for uh, potential mates during the rut. So they really they expend a lot of their energy during the summer. Uh, bighorn are, they're really large animals for the desert. They're probably the largest native animal in the Mojave Desert. I, I can't think of unless mule deer, <laughs> which aren't really as desert adapted. So that gives them a cop out, but their bighorn are highly mobile in the landscape. They, have a, they range far and wide. And they can also subsist on a ridiculous variety of foods. They eat just about anything as long as it's a plant. They eat cactus, they'll eat dried up stuff. They'll eat stuff that you would think there's no way they can survive on it, but somehow they figured that out. Um, the way they do this is they're what we call browsers. They have smaller, they're smaller animals than say a cow, which is a grazer. Cows are much larger than bighorn. Cows can weigh thousands of pounds, whereas bighorns weigh 200. So bighorn are limited by the size of their rumen. The rumen is where they put all their plant animal materials that they eat and then they ferment it with their bacteria that they got and they are able to digest it then. They're able to digest cellulose, which we can't digest because we're not ruminants. So they will basically eat what they can until they're full and then they have to go and they have to ruminate, which is where they have to sit and let their basically let their guts do the work, digest. They spit it back up, they chew their cut at this time, they send it back down. Um, and that's just what they're limited by. And because they're limited by these smaller rumens and uh, grazers, like a cow or an elk, they have to focus on much more high quality forage, which is, for example, if you've ever, not, maybe not in Southern Nevada, but in perhaps in Northern Nevada or other states, deer will come in your backyard and they'll eat all your rose bushes. I know that drives my mom nuts. Uh, and the reason why they eat all the flowers is because that's the high protein stuff. Deer are also browsers. So they are basically taking the best uh, forage they have available, which is your rose blossoms. So um, the, the ewes will actually run when they have uh, lambs. They will run a deficit, a caloric deficit and a water deficit to ensure that their babies survive, which I think is pretty fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them are just, they're just great moms, I guess. So uh, they, they, they sacrifice a lot to reproduce in such a harsh, uh, harsh environment. So bighorn usually, uh, they're diurnal in nature, although they will come in to drink uh, during the night a lot, especially in areas where uh, predation is happening. But they're most active during the early mornings and the, the evenings. And the hottest time of the day, they will bed down and they'll chew their cud. <laughs> so uh, they will take advantage of shade in the, the height of the summer, like over rocky overhangs, they'll, they'll go and they'll hang out in those. And if you actually look in those things, you're ever out. Like sometimes uh, you're a little, get a little wild hair and you're out there in the summer, that's what you might see them during the height of the day. So they, they, they also are herd animals. They'll gather in herds. Uh, herds go up to a hundred, but I've never seen a herd that large. Uh, five to 10 is more common, especially in Southern Nevada. Although there are certain guzzlers in the Muddy Mountains where we have really high population densities that probably do have a uh, hundred or more sheep at one time. So the lambs are born in February, at early March, which uh, makes perfect sense for the Mojave Desert. That's when the greenup's happening. That's when food is most available. That's when basically a lactating ewe will have the most resources at her disposal. The best forage, the most water. She will not have to move as much as she would normally. So that's why they are desert adapted to drop around February, early March, right with the onset of spring. So lambs nurse for about five months before they make the switch to solid food, um, at which point uh, fall is here and the food really sucks. So I guess they figure that out pretty fast. So the lambs will follow their, uh, their mother uh, in, a, in a ewe group. A uh, ewe group is usually led by a really smart old ewe who's been around for a long time and knows her way around. 
and uh, young rams will usually stay in this herd for about a year uh, before they leave and they'll join up in what's called bachelor herds when they go basically hang out with the other rams and they size themselves up and they compete for mates at that time. So rams, hang on the bachelor group. There are some nice rams uh, grazing uh, at the, the park in Boulder City at Hemingway Park, which is a great place to go see bighorn if you want to go see bighorn. So they'll fight for dominance during the, the rut period. They get a big influx of testosterone. Their necks get nice and thick and they start fighting. Um, we don't usually see the real dramatic, like what you would think where the two sort of snort and square off and then charge and collide. You don't really see that in Southern Nevada because it's a desert, it's hot and rut is in July. <laughs> so they're, uh, they're not dumb. They basically will size each other up, a lot of leaning on each other. You'll see them more rearing up on each other and clonking each other uh, in that way. Uh, and, and, and if you go to the Hemingway Park in July, you will probably see that kind of behavior. So it, it's worth checking out. Just keep your distance because they are full of testosterone and they are chasing the ewes and the ewes sometimes uh, have had enough and they'll ra race around. So just keep your distance, but enjoy them. Uh, rams can smell if a ewe is receptive if she's in what's called estrus, where basically she's receptive to mating at that time. Basically, she'll take a piss, and they'll smell it. You'll see them do this thing where they curl their lips back like And you'll see that they have no top teeth because <laughs> um, they have pads instead of top teeth. They only have bottom teeth. And that's how they'll smell it. Uh, they'll smell if they're using estrus because they're probably so full of testosterone. They'll go and try to do their thing anyway, uh, but she's not going to let them unless she's receptive. So bighorn are up in the mountains. That's where you're going to see them. You're not going to see them in the valley bottoms unless something's wrong with them. So they use wise, it's called escape terrain. Escape terrain is uh, really steep, nasty stuff that basically they can run up because they're super strong. They are like the guy who goes to the gym and misses, skips leg day and he's just all huge in the top and he's all small on the bottom because they are basically doing pull-ups all day to get up to the, up in this escape terrain. So <laughs> they really have, they have really strong four quarters as opposed to their back quarters. Not that their back quarters aren't strong. They can leap like 16 feet or something ridiculous but they, uh, they're very strong in their upper body strength. So, and that's because of the, they live in escape terrain where you would see like deer or elk would just flee away from cliffs. Bighorn will just go right over the side of them, right up them. And that's just how they've adapted to escaping from predators. Um, the big predator for them would be mountain lions in Southern Nevada. That's pretty much the only predator, natural predator large enough to take them out outside of humans who well, do still take them out occasionally. So they also like to be able to see, they're very visual and very alert. I mean, that's why uh, herding behavior is so successful as it is because it's more eyes on the landscape. I mean, strength in numbers, right? So they're, uh, they like having that open, clear habitat, which is why they don't go up into really dense PJ or uh, sorry, pinion juniper woodlands uh, in the North McCall, although they will utilize areas that have decent views that are somewhat treed. Uh, and they're also reliant on springs being relatively clean of vegetation as well. Uh, okay, so you can age a, a, a bighorn sheep by its uh, horn growth. Uh, right here, you can see what, then you see a small, it's kind of faint line right here. That would be its lamb tips. That's its first, that's the horn it's born with. Um, it, and that's its first year's growth. They, they might actually, what's called broom, which is basically they'll, sorry, they rub that on like rocks or trees or cars or whatever they could find uh, to grind that down because it actually can get in the way of their, their vision. Uh, the next you'll see, they'll have lines going down. You see this one, uh, the third year is actually really is more, more or less the most distinctive year. Um, and the fourth year, fifth year, their horn growth starts to slow down. Sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. This is a nice old mature ram at nine years. They, I've seen rams in the wild as old as 12, 15 years, but that's rare. Uh, six-year-old, the full-grown ram. Uh, at six years, their horns start to regress in their growth. Or, well, five years, their horns start to regress in, in growth. And their growth really, really slows. So let's talk about the McCullough Mountain specifically. Uh, the McCulloughs are a relatively tall mountain. Like I said, 7,000 feet, uh, which is relatively tall. Uh, but what is really unique about them is how well connected they are to other ranges, the spring range, the much larger spring range, the river range, which of course has the river, Colorado River right through it, uh, the Highland Range, the New York Mountains over in California. And they're really well connected uh, for a 
bighorn have traveled all throughout those ranges. We have known from collaring data when we put a radio transmitter collar on them and watch them walk around the landscape. We know they will go in these adjacent ranges. So they are moving about. Um, the McCullough Range in the southern portion has some actual large springs. Pine Springs, really large spring. McCullough Springs, very large spring that have perennial, that offer perennial water. The southern range where Sloan Canyon is located does not really have the natural water sources. So instead of that, it has six artificial sources, which are basically rain catchments that the Nevada Park of Wildlife and not for profits have constructed for the bighorn sheep to keep their habitat intact in the Southern McCullough Range. Uh, historically, that the, the Southern portion of the range would have had access to Duck Creek, but that's now Henderson. So it's not accessible to them anymore, but that was a very large water source that they would have culminated at. They would have come down and gathered on water sources. The, the Bighorn, again, are reliant on surface water during the summer. They drink, depending uh, on, during the winter, they get almost, well, they, they do get all their water from metabolic water from the food they eat. But in the summertime, forage dries out and they are reliant on uh, surface water. So, so that's the, the niche the guzzlers then fill. So uh, yeah, the, like I said, guzzlers is an artificial water catchment. It captures and stores rainwater. They do not use groundwater they do, or spring sources. Uh, spring source would be a developed spring. Uh, they, they can be any size, but the bighorn ones are big game and they have about nine to 11,000 depending uh, gallons of water, depending on how many animals are using them at that time. Uh, Nevada has a lot of guzzlers because Nevada is a dry state. Uh, here's a picture of a guzzler uh, in its most modern design. This is what's called an apron, which is basically like a, if you had a, a tin roof, but with no building. So water lands on the tin roof, it goes down to the gutter of the tin roof, and then it goes down into holding tanks where it is stored. Uh, these tanks right here are 2,300 gallons each. So it has about 11,000 gallon capacity when full. And oh, then there's a pipe that runs all the way over to here and that little red circle. And that's what we call a drinker, which is essentially a water. And uh, that water trough is then set at the same level as the tanks, which allows this thing to be functioning in a wild setting where maintenance is really difficult to, to do um, because we don't have the presence to create something that's going to generate a lot of maintenance for us. And the animals are relying on these things. Even if we rip this out of the landscape right now, these sheep would come back and visit this spike expecting a drink because that's just how sheep operate. They expect to get a drink. Just like if we turned the water off, you would still go to the, you would still go to the faucet expecting water to come out of that faucet because that's just where it is. <laughs> so uh, sometimes we also have these things called slick rock dam, where you dammed uh, a small drainage. Uh, like uh, you can only really do this where the rock is hard and come together and form something that you can actually build a, a catchment on. Uh, there's a typical steel apron we got. We paint them uh, a to kind of make them look less obnoxious, and b if they were shiny metal, they would look like water, and then we'd have ducks and shorebirds bouncing off them, expecting to be landing in a pond which we don't want. So uh, occasionally we have to fence them. Uh, these are other flat tanks. This is one up north that we built up in this country for antelope, uh, where we have uh, a permittee that actually is running the, the area. So we built a fence so that uh, he wouldn't have to come chase his cows off our guzzler. Um, there's a, drinkers are critical. Uh, the drinkers dictate what can, uh, what can come in and get water there. Uh, this is a steel drinker. It's the same height as the tanks, like I said. And as the water column, the tanks, uh, starts going down, the water column in the drinker starts going down. And the idea is, again, no moving parts because moving parts can fail. Uh, so we've had 61 species of animals have been observed drinking at guzzlers across the state. So everything from large animals like elk, we, this is a picture of some lions nursing, uh, drinking at it. We got tons of birds use these things. Uh, we've seen toads using uh, red spotted toads, specifically using the guzzler, the, the drinkers for uh, to rear tadpoles. We've seen iguanas come and take a drink. Uh, so that, six, that number 61 is probably underestimated. We're probably not capturing the things that, because that 61 number was based on trail camera data. Uh, we're not capturing stuff that is really fast moving like bats. We don't know uh, how these things, uh, bats are using. Even though they're using them, we don't, don't know to what degree and what species are using them. So just a real quick history. First it was built in 1956. Uh, much of it was small game stuff, trying to get quail. Uh, you know, beef up the quilt. 
in the sixties, when bighorn sheep started really, there was basically the uh, sheep strain started to decline across their range. And the state said we had to do something and uh, the BLM and the, the land manager, the forest service, wildlife service, um, they came together and they decided that water was limiting sheep on the landscape. And so we started building guzzlers until about uh, the go-go 80s, go-go 90s. And then it started to taper off. We kind of built all the ones that we really had, can build in some of the best habitat. Not, that, not to say we put the brakes on it, where we are still constructing new guzzlers in areas that it's prudent, but it's definitely slowed down or more of a maintenance role or improving the ones we currently have. Uh, so why are we all doing this? Why would we do the sheep need wa water? Why, why do they need artificial water? They, they survive thousands and thousands of years without artificial water. Why all of a sudden they need it? Well, <laughs> we showed up, <laughs> we took all their water. So all the best sources were appropriated for industrial use. Uh, we built Henderson over Duck Creek. So <laughs> that's what happens. And also habitat fragmentation is a huge thing. These sheep used to be able to follow the best forage. They used to be able to go right across the valley so to another mountain range, if the, the McCullers were dry one year, they would go to the rivers, they would go to the springs where rainfall had been falling. Well, they can't do that as easily as they, because we built highways, we built cities, we built all kinds of stuff. So we have fragmented their habitat and now they are more in need of a self-contained within range habitat. So this is uh, something of a speculative map, but it does give you some really interesting points. See, in 1860s, this is what we estimate the uh, bighorn distribution looked across the state. Pretty much every single mountain range had bighorn sheep in it. Uh, if you look at 1960s, this is what we had left at uh, 100 years later. And it's really interesting to note that if you look at where it is, it's in the desert of around Las Vegas. It's in a few mountain ranges up by Tonopah and the Grand basically <laughs> up near Ely. So the reason being, because these are this area and this area were so dang dry that they were really unusable for sheep ranch. You had one sheep ranch allotment that went uh, up the Topak Wash. And, and that's because the sheep really, uh, they, they brought with them when the message were brought over here, they brought a lot of the zoonotic diseases that were exotic to these sheep. And that really did a number on them. Uh, and that's why you see these clusters of sheep in areas that were unsuitable for ranching sheep. Ranching domestic sheep, sorry. So yeah, and again, 1970 was the go, go, go. And uh, we, the BLM, uh, bless their hearts, built a lot of guzzers uh, with Endow. And now this is the current distribution. So that, that is in part a huge recovery efforts done by the land managers, the states, and a lot of money and interest coming in from not for profits uh, that are interested in conserving these animals. Um, the, the public has done a lot of trap and transplant back in the 70s and uh, all the way up until recently. Uh, and the goal was they introduced sheep source populations down near uh, Las Vegas up, up to these mountain ranges and reintroduced sheep. When it's worth noting also the muddy mountain population right here where my cursor is, uh, it's just a really robust population of sheep. They seem to just be putting, they seem to do really well and they put out a lot of individuals and a lot of genetics for range wide for the desert bighorn and trace their order back to the Muddy Mountain herd. Uh, another one would be the, uh, uh, the sheep range right here. Uh, go to standard reason that a mountain called the sheep range would have lots of sheep in it. So again, bighorn reliant on surface water during the summer. Um, after the seasonal green up passes, they will drink. Um, I know the ewes will drink almost daily. The rams don't seem to need water nearly as much, despite being bigger animals. Uh, and that's because they are, they're not supporting a lamb the way the ewes are. And uh, it's, uh, another thing to worth note is that when water is available, other species will drink. Um, another one thing is uh, snoring pronghorn, for example, uh, they've noticed in the drought years, they will start eating choya and other things to try and regain water. Uh, but if there's water available, they will drink and it allows them to favor better forage. So as we see brome invading uh, and, just, you know, declining in quality of forage across range for bighorn, these uh, guzzers are going to be even more important moving forward. So again, this is a trap transplant. This sheep is uh, 
getting, this is you right here. She's getting uh, tested for disease uh, so we can transplant her to another mountain range to try and serve as a source population. Um, we've sent sheep to Texas. We've sent sheep all the way down to Mexico. Uh, where bighorn sheep have been extirpated. So uh, this is worth saying that natural sources are absolutely best and worth protecting. That's a uh, hundred spot on. Natural sources are way better than guzzlers every, in every way, shape, and form. But guzzlers do work. Uh, and a lot of times you know, we have to take the guzzlers to the sheep. You can't just build them in the valley and expect them to show up. It's not a field dream situation. So we have to actually strap all our materials up to helicopters and fly them up the top of the mountain. And uh, that puts them away from roads, which uh, adds significant value to the wildlife structure. Uh, and of course, I wanna give a shout out to all the volunteers that uh, come out and help us with this, the Fraternity Desert Bighorn, uh, the Wild Sheep Foundation, uh, the Nevada Bighorns Unlimited, all those guys have a long history of supporting uh, the Guzzler program, both financially and by volunteering, coming out and building it with us. And, if, uh, and, and, and they're volunteers. And if you would like to get involved with us, absolutely strong encourage you to. Uh, they're a really great group of people, really conservation oriented, and uh, they accept all the help they can get. <laughs> so, so Bighorn Sheep and the McCullough's, uh, right now I would say they're doing okay to poor, unfortunately. The uh, Bighorn Sheep numbers and the McCullough's have been declining for the last 20 years. This is what we know from aerial surveys. Uh, and we are in the, pro the process of actively managing this. Uh, we constructed two new guzzlers back in 2015 to try and uh, reverse the trend of the bighorn declining in McCullough's. Um, so the reason why they're declining is sadly because of a mix of diseases, uh, zoonotic diseases. Um, you'll hear pneumonia a lot. Now pneumonia is not a disease, pneumonia is a clinical uh, condition where basically your lungs are getting are filling with fluid uh, and that's because of several different you know, uh, bacteria and viruses that they can get. Um, the uh, main one would be uh, the, the pastorella and uh, uh, the pastorella and the mycoplasm pneumonias which are zoonotic diseases that have their origins in the old world sheep populations they came over here with domestic sheep and um, around 1880, we actually know this from uh, hunters' records at the time. The hunters were coming in, the pioneers were coming in, and they were uh, shooting whatever, they, whatever, pretty much whatever moved. And they were shooting a lot of bighorn up until about 1880, 1890. Uh, then the bighorn numbers, the, or the take numbers, really started to drop off. And they started shooting more uh, mule deer, which is an indicative of a pneumonia outbreak basically crashing the whole bighorn population. Because if those uh, sheep were around for the pioneers to shoot, they would have shot them. So uh, we know that, that these things came in with the early onset of uh, settlement, of, I'm sorry, of uh, Indo-European <laughs> settlement. <laughs> so uh, we, we know that that's uh, basically what happened when the settlers started showing up. So uh, it's one thing, uh, just like with normal flu, you have different strains that can come in um, and be some can be more deadly than others. Some can be, worse. and one of the reasons the, the, the Cullen Mountains have been so hard hit by the pneumonia diseases die-offs is because they're so well connected to the surrounding range. So connectivity, despite the fact that it's so important for conservation in the long run, uh, is a double-edged sword and then it can get back to you. So uh, different strains we've noticed and we do, are doing disease surveillance. We got what is uh, recently the more deadly Mojave strain, which is in, was in Mojave National Park, uh, first discovered in Mojave National Park, which is why it was named as such. And uh, that shows in that uh, more recently, and now it's in the spring rounds and it does what pneumonia does. Basically it burns the population. There's an initial die off of animals, but what really is uh, the problem is the lamb recruitment. Um, it remains low. The lambs just can't deal with that disease. Once, as soon as they get uh, off their mother's milk, as soon as they get weaned and they're no longer getting those antibi antibodies from their mother, they just get pneumonia and die. And, and that seems to persist for a long period of time. Uh, we usually uh, study the lambs that we see on the landscape when we do aerial surveys, when we do in the fall. And we can actually get it as uh, an idea of how disease is burning through this population, where it's at, based on the number of lambs we see. 
Um, what you'll see when uh, you have a sick sheep is you'll see a lot of, uh, they'll be, you know, wait, what you'll see with a sick person, they'll be coughing, they'll have nasal discharge, basically they'll be snotty, and uh, they'll just be lethargic, tired, uh, just like how you would be if you were sick. So you want to lay in bed all day. Uh, the sheep don't have that option, so they lay down, they'll cough, and they have nasal and snotty, and it's gross. Um, hopefully, they recover. So, I mean, but I, you can't guarantee that they, there's no vaccine for this. We couldn't administer it even if there were one um, because these are wild animals. We can't just <laughs> grab them, stem them with a vaccine for something that has multiple strains. It's like we couldn't administer a flu vaccine for people that don't want to get flu vaccines. <laughs> It's the same thing. Uh, so uh, there's no vaccine. There's really nothing we can do but kind of watch these things at this point in time. Um, uh, there, there, there's other diseases they can get. They can get sinusal tumors. They have sinuses that go up into their horns. They can get sinus tumors. They can get all kinds of skin ailments, uh, mites, uh, mange, uh, and all kinds of stuff. Um, domestic sheep are asymptomatic. Uh, unfortunately, so even if someone were ranching their sheep, they would have no way of knowing they were potentially be introducing these diseases to bighorn sheep populations. The only way to really do that is to separate the domestic sheep from the bighorn sheep. And we've done that on some ranches in some places by doing double fences because the diseases, the pneumonia can actually travel through the air uh, for like 20 feet or 20 yards or something like that. Uh, you cannot get pneumonia from a sheep. <laughs> so that's, that's fine, but um, they can contact it from other sheep and uh, populations can recover. They have recovered. So it's not all doom. I don't want it to be all doom and gloom, uh, but the, the disease is currently the biggest uh, one or one of the biggest threats to bighorn recovery. Uh, again, this is the bighorn recovery Popul population map. And this is what we're striving for to have every one of these mountain ranges that historically held sheep to once again, historically hold sheep. So other threats, of course, the big one that always seems to come up is habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. Uh, this is actually a picture off of Black Mountain looking at Vegas, which I think is, you can see it creeping. So Sloan is a line in the sand uh, in terms of habitat loss. Sloan Canyon uh, functions as basically preserving habitat and uh, habitat and preserving those, those habitat from becoming continuously more fragmented. Uh, and hopefully it, it also stops habitat quality from degrading. Uh, habitat quality being, uh, you know, having large amounts of trash dumped in it, basically. <laughs> um, so invasive weeds will follow people around. The brome, uh, brome grass is one of the big ones. It can create wildfire, which of course is going to de degrade habitat quality for a number of species. Um, bighorn can tolerate wildfire a lot better than others. Uh, animals can, but it still degrades habitat quality. Uh, and Again, species don't go extinct for one reason, they go extinct for thousands of reasons. So what we really have to preserve is what we call core habitat. Now, core habitat is the really good stuff. It's a habitat that's large enough to support a large enough population that it can then have create more sheep and then those sheep could potentially go into other areas. So it's a core habitat is an exporter of sheep to surrounding possibly less good habitat. Uh, McCullough's, given that they're as high as they are, given the abundance of water and forage that they have, would be our core habitat. The Spring Mountains are core habitat, but other lower lying ranges like say the Highland Range or the Bird Spring Range would not be core habitat. They're much smaller, they're much lower, and they just don't have the habitat available to create more sheep at a rate that those sheep would then be exported to another habitat type. So identifying and protecting core habitat is incredibly important. And not again, uh, protecting it from getting degraded just because we've drawn a line in the sand surrounding it doesn't equate to protection. Protection equates to protection. So we have to make sure that these core habitats are not degraded and they don't become a uh, population, what we call a sink population, where they, which is a population that is no longer exporting sheep that is now reliant on an ingress of sheep coming in from adjacent core habitats. Uh, connectivity is incredibly important. Um, I'm going to quote, it's apparently, I thought it's not Charles Darwin who said this, but it's not the strongest species survived, nor the most intelligent survives. It's the one that can adapt to change. The only way you're going to get species that adapt for change is if you have these 
connectivity corridors protected so that they're able to adapt to change. Connectivity is how genetics flow. That's how a successful species in one range can move and become a successful species in another. So if let's say we have a population that gets hit really bad by pneumonia that dies off, and, but there's a few survivors that have that immunity to that pneumonia, and then they, that population recovers, there's an adjacent mountain range that could suffer from pneumonia that then we've had ingress from that said core population. So we need to have the sheep to be able to move around on the landscape. Problem is it's easily lost. You build Highway 15 across it and you severed that connection corridor. Um, so that's, it's easily lost by linear features like highways and things that we kind of like to have. So carnivores are also important to uh, prey species. Uh, carnivores do what is called a trophic cascade. So they will basically come in and they'll do what carnivores do. They'll eat sheep, they'll hunt sheep, they'll kill sheep. Um, and that's fine. That's what they're supposed to do. Sheep have evolved with these guys for thousands and thousands of years. They know how to deal with it. They can recover from that. Uh, they will actually a uh, mountain lion will focus on a sick animal. That's, it's easier to take out a sick animal than it is to take out a healthy one. It's easier to take out a lamb than it is to take out a ram. Uh, just, that's just how it is. I mean, if you're picking a fight in a bar, you're going to pick it with the 150 pound guy, not the 300 pound guy. So uh, that's just how it is. And mountain lions aren't dumb. They're going to do what they can. So they basically make a population more fit by having that trophic, said trophic cascade. And they actually will help with disease by taking out sick animals so these sick animals can't can persist on the landscape and they then uh, don't become incredible vectors for disease and, and spread that disease. Uh, it's worth noting that hunting is not a substitute for carnivores. Hunters will take the best, the healthiest, the biggest animal, <laughs> which is the exact opposite of what carnivores will do. So you, you so back in the, what was it, the turn of the century, the, the Teddy Roosevelt was like, yeah, let's shoot all the carnivores so we can have all the Tons of uh, mule deer and sheep and stuff to hunt, which of course that didn't work out very well. So uh, carnivores can also change the behavior of animals. And we've noticed this, uh, not so much in bighorn sheep, but we have noticed this in the behavior of elk specifically uh, and how elk are related to say aspen stands, which is a, a great example of how aspen stands are dependent on more or less mountain lions and wolves to come in and to basically change their behavior because before they were just hanging out in aspen stands eating all the aspen shoots. So now they'll move about and they'll leave some of those aspen shoots intact. Uh, it's also want to say something that poaching is, is a threat and poaching is not hunting. Poaching is not legal, poaching is illegal and it should be seen as different from hunting. And although there's, uh, it's, uh, poaching isn't a huge impact of bighorn sheep, it could take a, a, a very strong individual that, out of a population that's already struggling. So poaching is a threat, but it is not, I want to sever it uh, association with legal hunting. Legal hunting is not a threat to bighorn. It's managed, the population gets so low that we can't have bighorn get taken by hunting methods, then we won't have tags for that area. So that's, uh, you can get involved as a guzzler inspector um, and you can get involved uh, as volunteer to build guzzlers or doing other things. Uh, we are always looking for volunteers. Uh, one of the ways we get our federal aid is through volunteers and utilizing them. All right, that's uh, pretty much what I've got. <laughs> cool. Uh, uh, for a couple questions. Absolutely. All righty. We had one that come in uh, that came in a few minutes ago when you were speaking about uh, how carnivores, um, uh, the, the predation affects uh, populations and the health of the population. Uh, the North McCullough Range, actually the North and South McCullough Range, do they have predators there? Absolutely. They both do. Um, they do? Are, they, there, absolutely. are there mountain lions in those ranges? Absolutely. There are mountain lions all over Nevada. They are strongly associated with mule deer, just because mule deer are easier to take than bighorn. Uh, so they're probably more strongly associated in the South McCulloughs, where the mule deer population is centered. But they will move about into the McCall, into the to the North McCalls where Sloan Canyon is. Um, the, the McCall range, being that they're an, an igneous parent material, they aren't as nasty as say a limestone range, like the Spring Mountains are a limestone range. Uh, basically, the pads that mountain lions have on their feet, bighorn don't have pads; they have these squishy hooks. They're really grippy. 
the mountain lion's pads aren't as uh, negatively affected by the igneous rock. So the mountain lions actually have an advantage in the cold range as, as opposed to say the spring mountains. Oh, so in the so yeah, if things get too tough, they can kind of flee into the into the McCullough. Uh, so yeah, the but range are gonna, gonna get away. Well, they're no. they're gonna no, <laughs> not really. Fair they're enough. stuck in the McCullough. Mountain lions range have humongous ranges, and they're really there's not very many out there. But I mean, a, a big tom that's a, a male mountain lion will range 20, 20 square miles. Will be its home range. I mean, it's huge. Uh, this, the, the McCullough range probably only has about three or four mountain lions in the entirety of the range because that's just how many they can support. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. I've always, uh, if you ask different people, they seem to have different opinions on whether uh, there's mountain lions in those ranges. So it's uh, it's interesting yeah, to think those guys are well, definitely popping there. around near our neighborhood. Uh, another question uh, is sort of uh, relating to, you, you uh, did a pretty thorough job talking about it, but um, I sort of want to get a feeling for how, um, you know, there's, there's efforts to uh, do uh, more development in the McCullough range, especially near like the, the junction between the North and South ranges. Um, if what, what sort of the, is there like a turning point where there could be development there, sort of a, a point of no return where uh, something happens on that range on, on or near that range that would really just cut off the North McCullough herds from from the South McCullough and beyond? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, there's there's a threshold for just about everything. Mm. Uh, I don't know what that threshold is. Uh, and and I'm, I think that you could talk to about 100 different people, you get 100 different answers of where that threshold would be. Um, I, I mean, if we built a huge, if we severed that population, there's a, a point where we would have, so the, let's say we built a, a whole sub uh, housing development all across the McCullough range and sever those two populations. Bighorn couldn't uh, transit across that range anymore. There would be a point where the genetics would bottleneck and they would start inbreeding because the population was so small. Um, they're, they're not gonna, and so that could, there is a threshold, there is something that exists. Where it is, I don't know. Fair enough, fair enough. And then I understand that correctly, there's still efforts uh, with um, Endow still, there's still an initiative in Endow to expand the ranges of the, of the desert bighorn sheep? Absolutely, a absolutely. But because of disease being what it is and us not wanting to spread disease across the landscape, the trap and transplant efforts have slowed down to almost nothing at this point. Uh, and that's just where we are right now. We don't want to introduce a sick sheep or put out all this money to put out sheep that are just going to bang and succumb to pneumonia. So it really has reached a breaking point uh, to where we don't have the ability to trap a transplant like we used to. Um, as we learn more about disease, that it might be, become an age where we trap a transplant more. Uh, as long as we can do it safely and effectively, then we can do it. But if we can't do it safely and effectively, there's no point in doing it. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, you mentioned that some of the herds uh, can get or communicate, you know, either interact with or migrate as far south as in the California Mojave National Preserve. Do you know how far? An indication is how far into California they may uh, migrate? Uh, just to put a number on it, we put one at 20 miles. A ram can move 20 miles in search of uh, rams, are usually the ones that, that move. The ewes will potentially set up home ranges and will be much more static. But rams are going to do what rams do, which is they're going to go out looking for ewes. So they're going to go 20 miles easily. They're completely capable of that. Um, they're not like mountain lions, which will go hundreds of miles, but they are highly vagile and they'll move across the landscape. Fascinating. All righty. Uh, I'm uh, looking for any more questions on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, I don't see any at this time, but I would encourage uh, if you are watching a recording of this and have a question, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we'll see if we can get uh, the answer for you. Um, in the meantime, I don't want to commit uh, Matt to spending all of his time answering <laughs> questions. Please, if you have a uh, question, email it to uh, info at friendsofsloan.org. We'll do the best we can to ask Matt or, uh, or get you an answer online. Something like that. And uh, with that, I think we're going to call it. This is uh, Friends of Sloan Canyon's first FSC Live.
And uh, we hope, I, I was monitoring, and I, I think that we had a, a couple bandwidth issues, especially on YouTube. It may have been a little uh, choppy on YouTube, but we'll get a, uh, a whole recorded version of it on YouTube uh, shortly, so you can view it there. And with that, I think we're going to call it an evening. All so righty, everybody. You, Enjoy your evenings again, everybody. I hope you and your family stay safe and healthy. Uh, please uh, stay home for Nevada, and uh, we'll get this uh, with a little bit of diligence and uh, some uh, self-control. We'll get through, we'll flatten that curve and get through this uh, these strange times as soon as possible. All righty, take care and everybody enjoy your day.